Welcome to this, our next edition of Daily Devotions, coming to you from Church of the Palms in Sarasota, Florida. We, as always, invite you to share these with those that you know and love. Let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds by listening to some beautiful piano music. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to thee, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture, scripture lesson today comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 91. Hear the word of God. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the hunter and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and defense. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My mother was the mother of four boys, no girls. It's the way that she wanted it. She saw a picture in a magazine when she was a young woman and that showed a mother in a chair surrounded by four sons and she said to herself, that's what I want. And that's what she got. She never regretted this wish, except the only time that she would come close to regretting it was the annual mother-daughter banquet that rolled around every year on the church calendar. 
course, she would have no one to bring. So she was always having to borrow someone else's daughter or niece or a next door neighbor girl in order to go. She could never, <clears throat> but she could never take her own. Well, then came the year when she grew tired of borrowing and she decided that she was going to take her own, which meant she was going to take me. I was four years old and she decided that she was going to dress me up as a little girl and take me as her daughter. And this is what she did. She dressed me to the nines, a little white dress, black patent leather shoes, white socks, white gloves, black purse, and top it all off, a brown pigtail wig and a white bonnet. I looked adorable. Many were sure that I was going to need years of therapy after this, but I still looked adorable. Off we went to the mother-daughter mother banquet, and I promised not to let anyone know who I was. I was to say that I was her niece, Lisa, and we fooled them, at least through the first half of the dinner. And then the wig grew hot, and I asked my mom if I could take it off. She said yes, so I yanked it off to the screams of our table mates. The women's association of that church has never been the same. It's been said that the clothes make the man. I always thought that was something Madison Avenue came up with, but actually it's a quote from Mark Twain when he wrote, one realizes that without his clothes, a man would be nothing at all, that the clothes do not merely make the man, the clothes are the man, that without them, he is a cipher, a vacancy, a nobody, a nothing. There is no power, Twain concludes, without clothes. I suppose in one sense, Twain is right. Clothes most certainly make an impression. They send a signal. Torn jeans tells you one thing. A tailored suit tells you another. A little white dress tells you another. But the truth is that in the most important sense, it's not the clothes that make the person. It's the person who makes the person. Interesting how little the Bible talks about clothing. No one knows, for example, what the Apostle Paul wore or what Peter wore or even what great King David wore. You don't hear, for example, that the disciple Thomas was sporting a brand new tunic he had purchased down at the village tailors or how all the other disciples commented on the fine stitching. You hear none of that. Usually the only time you hear about clothing is when it points to something bigger. Adam and Eve wear a fig leaf because their eyes were opened after eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they were ashamed. Joseph sports the coat of many colors and gets himself in trouble with his brothers. Jesus has a seamless tunic. And, and then there's the story of David and Goliath. I'm not sure there's a story more familiar in the Bible than David and Goliath. You probably would not have needed to grow up in a synagogue or a church to have heard the story of David and Goliath. It's a great story. The army of Israel and the army of the Philistines are lined up against each other. The Philistines have their secret weapon, the great giant Goliath. For 40 days, Goliath taunts the Israelites. He's wrapped with armor, and it's not just any armor. It's the best armor, and it's, not, and it's, it's bronze helmet and a coat of mail and a javelin and a spear and a shield. He's got it all, a walking metal giant. He's dressed to the nines. For this party, it seems he is the best dressed. When David steps forth, a little boy David, to accept the challenge of the giant, and after convincing King Saul that he's the one to do battle, Saul insists that he go to the party dressed with, for success. So the king puts his own armor on him, helmet and mail and accessories, all the right clothing it would appear. The problem is, after getting all this armor on, David can't walk. He's dressed for battle, but he can't do battle. You can imagine the comic scene, the little boy in a man's armor staggering around, tripping over himself. Not a good way to enter a duel. So David takes off the outfit and says, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of the Philistine. David strips his armor, bears his faith, his unalloyed faith. Five smooth stones, a staff, and a whole lot of faith he takes to the battle. And David basically does what David does. What matters most is that he's in the presence of God. He is who he is, and he's in the presence of the Lord, and he's doing what he thinks the Lord needs him to do. He doesn't need what he's dressed in. What he needs is his own faith. And we know, of course, the rest of the story. It's likely what Jimmy Stewart's father had in mind when the time came for his son, Jimmy Stewart, who had stepped away from his Hollywood fame and took his place among the enlisted in World War II, signing on to be, of all things, a bombardier pilot. His father, like any father, had great pride and yet great concern over his son's enlistment and assignment. 
In the end, he knew that, he, that what he was wearing was not going to help his son or hurt him. No uniform could keep him from getting shot down. So shortly before he left for the war, his father tucked into his pocket a little note. And the note said this, my dear Jim boy, soon after you read this letter, you will be on your way to the worst sort of danger. I'm banking on the enclosed copy of the 91st Psalm. The thing that takes the place of fear and worry, he continued, is the promise of these words. I'm staking my faith in these words. I feel sure God will lead you through this mad experience. I can say no more. I only continue to pray. Goodbye, my dear. God bless you and keep you. I love you more than I can tell you, Dad. Of course, the words of the 91st Psalm begin this way. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. We live in a difficult world and we live in difficult times. And that sentence I just spoke is true today, and it has been true every day of human existence. We live in a difficult world, and we live in difficult times. And what makes the person is the person. And what makes a person strong and courageous and willing to face into the difficulties, <clears throat> what makes that person face into those difficulties is the knowledge of the presence of God. For it is the awareness of God's presence that steals us to face the day, whatever day that faces us. No armor needed, no three-piece suit or little white dress, just to live in the shelter of the Most High and to abide in the shadow of the Almighty, to say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise you for your presence and your presence is our strength. Help us to step forward and face what faces us, for you will never let us go. Amen. <clears throat>